and uh, tonight I would like to present a brief high-level overview of our technology. So, as you have already heard, a uh, very scalable, confidential store value point over MIMBO-LIMBO protocol. It's an original implementation meaning that we didn't borrow any uh, code from anyone. We built our blockchain from scratch. We're using the proof-of-work algorithm called Equihash. And uh, we have a capped emission using uh, periodic housing. We're supported by Treasury, as uh, Alexander mentioned. And uh, uh, right now, we're still uh, closed source, but the source will be open in September when we'll also launch our public testnet. And uh, I think we should start from understanding how Mimble Wimble works and uh, what are the advantages of this uh, interesting protocol. So, Mimble Wimble white paper was published about two years ago by an anonymous author. And uh, in this relatively short, like four or five pages long white paper, uh, there is a, an interesting approach and new approach to creating confidential uh, blockchain. And uh, it immediately drew some attention and people started uh, looking into it, verifying it, uh, publishing papers about it, because the idea was very elegant and very interesting. And uh, this protocol is actually based on two uh, key elements that were known before that, two existing elements. The first one is called confidential transactions, and the second one is transaction custody. So confidential transaction idea is to allow uh, the participants of the transaction to encrypt or obscure the value of the transaction in a way that is only visible to them, but is completely obscured from anybody, from anybody else uh, watching the blockchain. In Limbo Limbo, the confidential transaction is created using a cryptographic commitment scheme, specifically Pedersen commitment. And as you can see in this, uh, in this equation, each UTXO is actually represented as a sum of two factors. So here, G and H are two generator points on the same elliptic curve. It's important to understand that it should be uh, nothing up my sleeve points, so the relation between them is not known to anyone, which is a very important thing. V is the actual value of the transaction, and R is the blinding factor, which uh, obscures the value of the transaction itself, but it also serves as some kind of secret key, which allows me to prove my ownership of the transaction. So in order to prove my, that I own this specific UTXO, I need to disclose both the blinding factor and the value. Now using this uh, definition of UTXO, we can see that the basic transaction in Mimble Wimble will actually look something like this. Right, so this is a simple transaction with one input, one output, and when we want to make sure this transaction is valid, First of all, before we start talking about who owns what and why, we need to make sure that no new value was accidentally created and no value disappeared uh, into the void during the transaction. So basically what we want to show is that the sum of inputs is equal to the sum of all outputs, or in other words, that the sum of this entire expression with appropriate signs is zero. And we can clearly see that this is the case because both expressions are actually identical. So it's very simple to see that the sum is indeed zero and this is a valid transaction. However, this transaction is not very practical because as you can see, there is some problem here. Uh, if some nice guy named Alice wanted to send some value to some nice girl named Bob, he would uh, manage to do that, however, as you can see, both of them use the same lining factor, so both of them actually retain ownership of the same UTXO, which probably is not ultimately what uh, uh, Bob would want. So what Bob would want to do is to change uh, the blinding factor from R1 to some other uh, factor R2 that only Bob knows, and that thus he would be the only owner of the resulting UTXO. However, this uh, kind of messes up our validation because it's obviously not going to sum to zero anymore. So in order to make this work, we need to introduce another additional component to this transaction called the kernel. And the kernel is just the difference between the blinding factors of Alice and Bob multiplied by the G generator point. And now we have a better situation and actually uh, sums to zero, but 
we want to make sure that this kernel doesn't accidentally store some value inside of it or create some value out of nothing. So what we will ask Bob to do, since Bob knows both R1 and R2, we would ask you to sign an empty message using this as a private key and then we can verify that this is indeed the case by using this expression here, R2 minus, minus R1 uh, multiplied by the generator point as a public key. Now in a more realistic situation, we probably will have also some uh, transaction fee that will go to the miner and uh, this the entire expression will still pass validation and uh, the sigma of the all expressions with appropriate signs will be zero. Now we can do something a little bit more interesting. What we can do is actually take part of this difference between R2 and R1 and call it an offset. We will subtract this offset and we will store it separately, just as a scalar, in the open, not encrypted. And what will, this will allow us to do, if we have several transactions uh, together in a block, for example, we will sum the offsets of these transactions and this will make the entire block in completely inseparable. So once these two transactions are merged, there is absolutely no way to unscramble them, which of course adds uh, to the privacy because once you have the block, you cannot really know which inputs and which outputs and which ones belong to which transactions. In addition to uh, the, the kernel, we also need to provide a proof that the transaction value is actually positive and does not overflow. And for that, we're using non-interactive zero-knowledge range proofs, uh, specifically bullet proofs, which is the, one of the most uh, efficient implementations of uh, these kind of proofs. And we only use those for this specific reason. They are attached to every output to make sure that the output is positive. Because if we would manage to create negative output, we can actually create money out of nothing. Like we'll create two transactions, with plus 10 points and minus 10 points, then hide the minus 10 and use the plus 10 to pay somebody else. We don't want to allow that. Uh, this is actually a very important part of the protocol. It's uh, time consuming to create and validate. It's also uh, consuming in terms of the transaction size, but it uh, uh, has to be there in order to the, for the entire system to function properly. Now, if we look at the topic of transaction with several inputs and several outputs and the kernel and some fees. And we stack several transactions together, we see that the structure of the transactions is almost identical. So basically, when we take a lot of these transactions and call them a block, the structure of the block is very similar to the structure of the transaction. So it's just more inputs, more outputs, more kernels and more fees but the structure is basically the same. So the validation of the block is very similar to the validation of the transaction. And this is very important going forward because what we can do now, we will see, we will notice that in some cases, we will receive a situation in which Alice sent some UTXO to Bob, and then Bob forwarded the same UTXO to Carol. And once we combine all the transactions in the block, we will see that the, these two uh, elements here, they actually uh, disappear, right? They will be removed when we sum all the transactions because it's two identical UTXOs, one is an input, one is an output, they will just cancel themselves out. In this situation, all we care about is how Alice got the money whether it was done in a legitimate way, and the fact that Carol currently owns this UTXO. Now, if we extend this logic to the entire blockchain, let's take all the blocks together in the entire blockchain and merge them, what we receive is one very large block, we call Mega Block, which will only have the Coinbase and the current UTXO set. So, as we saw, the structure of the UTXO is very similar to that of a single transaction, we can sort all elements within a block and by doing so obscure the origin of each input and output. And the cut through can be performed both within a block and across a block, across several blocks. What we actually get, we get some sort of system state which we internally represent as a Merkle tree. And this tree actually tells us which UTXOs are currently in the system, 
And what we can do, we basically call it a system state, and we can see that in order to trans get a transition from some previous state to current state, all we need is just to receive a new block, which should be valid, of course. And this block contains all the information that I need to transfer between, between states. It tells me which UTXOs were consumed, which UTXOs were created, and basically this is how the entire system works. Now when I look at the block, I see that it has basically two parts. The header and the body. The header has the root hash of that Merkle tree that we saw earlier, and the proof of work, of course, created by the miner to make sure that the blockchain is valid. But the body contains all the transactions. And this is the bulk of the information in the blockchain. So at this point, all we need to verify the entire blockchain is just all the headers in the blockchain and the current state of the system. Which is, of course, much less information than the entire transaction history. And this is enough to validate the entire blockchain. One of the things that Mimble Mimble had to give up in order to be able to create all this uh, uh, beautiful math using patterns and commitments is the idea of using scripts to describe transactions as it is done in Bitcoin. And this created some concerns because Bitcoin script actually allows for uh, creating various types of transactions. And uh, in Mimble Mimble, we don't have any scripting, so we have to resolve the situation somehow. And the idea that was proposed is uh, something called script the script, which is in implementation of the same transaction types that we would generally use in everyday life, but using cryptographic primitives instead of scripts. Using this technology, we can implement several types of transactions, for example, time lock transactions. By adding a maturity parameter to each UTXO, we can make sure it will be valid only at some point in the future. We can also implement escrow transactions and atomic swaps. We might also want to disclose some information about the transaction to some authorized third party. And the idea of auditable transactions should allow us to do exactly that. We have some kind of additional auditing key that will allow to see the details of the transaction without actual transfer, actually transferring the ownership of the user. So to that third party. And if, if we will manage to do that, uh, it, I, I think it will be very useful in uh, many practical use cases for confidential cryptocurrencies in general. How does it work in practice? Let's say we have two wallets, the sender and the receiver. They can connect to each other either online using a direct connection or in a semi-online mode using some intermediate system what we call the secure bulletin board. It does not have to be centralized, it can be decentralized, it can be implemented using distributed hash tables. And, of course, it has to be encrypted, it has to be secure, and uh, it just basically passes messages between the two wallets. And it's important to understand that this system has nothing to do with the blockchain. It has no relation to the nodes. It's just a separate system which allows us to connect two wallets together. When we start, uh, a in order to start a connection, I want to be able to identify the wallet. So the receiver wallet generates some random identifier. It can be a unique identifier for each transaction, or any sender, or just a permanent identifier. Then it sends it to the sender using some kind of uh, external channel, Telegram, I don't know, Queer Pigeons, or whatever. And then the sender initiates the transaction via the secure BBS, and once the transaction is created in several steps, it is then sent to the node for processing. It, in this entire process, no addresses are sent to the nodes or recorded in the blockchain. This is why, why we say that actually in Nimble Wimble there are no addresses. The only thing that is sent is the commitments themselves that have the encrypted value inside of them. Both wallets have to participate in the creation of the transaction. And I'm not Bitcoin where I just can have that address of somebody to send in points. In this case, both wallets have to actively sign uh, some parts of the transaction in order for it to be valid. And the wallet has to store both the transaction value and the blinding factor for each UTXO they own, which is a major difference from how it currently works with existing uh, currencies and most of the existing currencies. So the 
experience here for the user is a little bit different. Uh, but it is solvable using uh, hardware world integration with some semi random like, uh, blinding factor generation. So we believe we will be able to provide a good experience for that as well. And uh, even though we can see that very little information is actually uh, sent and stored in the blockchain, basically just the commitments which are encrypted. Despite that fact, uh, there are still some concerns about the security of the system, at least on the uh, level of the network protocol. Because if we can imagine a situation where you have some malicious node listening to the network and connected to all the nodes in the system, of course it will receive all the transactions. And uh, using uh, uh, some network analysis, it, can, it, it was shown by, by very interesting research that you can actually detect the originating node if all the transactions are broadcast by every node as, as soon as, they, as the node gets the transaction. And this can allow uh, interested parties with certain probability to uh, the anonymize parts of the parts of the network, which is not what we want. And in order to avoid this from happening, there was an interesting uh, suggestion from Dandelion that was proposed. And the idea works as follows. When a node gets a transaction, instead of instantly sending it to all its peers, it just selects a random peer and first sends the transaction to this peer. The second node flips a coin and if it comes heads with the probability of, for example, 50%, it will send the transaction to yet another peer and another one until the coin flips tails and then this node will actually send the transaction uh, to all the spheres and uh, they will do the same uh, the rest of the way. This resembles the line in some way, which is where the name comes from. But what it actually allows us to do is to scramble away that the transaction is distributed and uh, make this uh, detection uh, much harder, detection of the initiating node. If along the way we will be also able to merge some transactions together using the, uh, the offsets that we saw. So basically I get a transaction and instead of sending exactly the same transaction, I combine it with another transaction and send both of them together. Uh, this process of uh, uh, the anonymization will be even more difficult. So a couple of words about the roadmap. Right now we're in uh, August already. So uh, in September we will launch our public test maps and open the stores. Uh, we have uh, some plans to launch like, initially about 50 nodes with mining just that, so that people can connect to them and play with the system. Um, we will uh, also have a graphical wallet which will look something like this. Of course it just will be very early alpha version but uh, I believe it will be able to do the most basic types of transactions both online and offline which will be nice. And we're planning to launch the mainnet in uh, December. So after the launch, the world doesn't stop and we have some future plans and ideas going forward. Mobile wallet, definitely. We are starting to work on that already. Confidential assets is an interesting concept which can be implemented on top of uh, Mimo Wimbo. And uh, also smart contracts, maybe secondary solutions. So the thing is that uh, the fact that we have this kernel which does not disappear during the cut through and it can actually contain uh, information and metadata that can be used uh, in the transaction and it's signed by both parties enables us to extend the protocol and add more data that can be processed and thus enable creation of confidential assets and uh, maybe integration of secondary solutions such as Lightning Network, Thunderella uh, or maybe uh, others. Thank you. Any questions? If you find this thing for you, in order to spend a YouTube cell, I don't need to sign a message with a private key. Right? I just need uh, the uh, blind factor and the generator factor. 
Yeah, so in order to spend the UTXO, what you need to do, you need to connect directly to the wallet, either directly or via BBS system, to the wallet that you want to transfer the UTXO to, and you need to create a transaction together in which you agree that you are the owner of UTXO and you want to send it to the second wallet. So this is a big uh, vulnerability. I can simply try to get the two functions and try to... Yes, you are definitely right. Uh, there are two problems here. The first one is the initial connection problem, which means that I have to be sure that this is actually the person that I want to talk to. The same problem kind of exists when I send you my uh, address, for example, in Bitcoin. Maybe somebody can intercept it and uh, place it as an address, another address. And then, of course, the entire communication between wallets is done over a secure channel, and they use cryptographic protocol that makes sure that. Once the connection is established, there can, no, uh, there can be no man man in the middle attacks. So, uh, thank you for the presentation. I have two questions. First is about the mining. If I recall correctly, you told us that you're using the... Uh, I, for I forgot the uh, proof of work. Okay. I forgot about the, power of the proof of work you're using. Can you please elaborate a bit about why? What are the advantages for the two case? And the, the second one is... Uh, are you able to get into cryptographic or user implementation or public such a review and what is done? Yeah, so uh, we chose Equihash, which is the same uh, uh, algorithm that Zcash uses today. Uh, we wanted it to be uh, compatible with GPU mining, even though today there are also all the ASICs that can do that uh, a bit faster. We, we still believe that it would be a good idea to allow GPUs, uh, GPUs to mine our coin. Uh, and uh, we are using slightly different parameters than uh, uh, Zcash, so uh, it will be incompatible at least at first with some of the uh, asset miners on the market today, but of course it's quickly solvable. Um, and for, as for the second question, yes, right now we are in the process of selecting vendors for uh, uh, this security audit, uh, official security audit, uh, we will use several vendors for that. Uh, in addition to that, we are also inviting and uh, talking with the uh, experienced programmers in the field to review the code. Yeah, so we're doing all that definitely. More questions? Okay, thank you very much.